<laughs> so welcome everybody, welcome and a warm hello on behalf of Patients for Patient Safety Canada, the patient-led program of CPSI and the Canadian arm of the World Health Organization Patients for Patient Safety program. My name is Ioana Popescu, I am a Senior Program Manager with the Canadian Patient Safety Institute and today together with my colleague Janet Bradshaw we will host you. And our goal as hosts is for you to have an excellent experience during our time together. So let's have a quick look on uh, using the technology that we have today. Um, Janet, I'm going to slide number two that shows the chat box. So if you put your mouse in the middle of your screen, <clears throat> a few buttons will pop up right away. One of them has a thought bubble. That's our uh, chat menu. If you click on it, it will pop up, pop up on the right-hand side that's presented on the screen and you can chat with everybody or you can select the person you would like to talk to. To practice, I would ask you to, to tell us in the chat box what is your role. Um, in the registration form, we keep things very simple, but tell us if you're a patient partner or maybe your staff, a manager, or a healthcare provider on the front line. Tell us a little bit about you, just to practice. The session is recorded, except for the chat box. Uh, so don't worry about typos, just have fun. Um, engage with us, that will not be recorded or posted. The slide and the audio recorded will be made publicly available about a week, next week, um, on our website as well as through an email message to all of you. So now, let me introduce you to uh, Teresa Malloy Miller. She is going, our moderator for today. Teresa uh, is joining us today from Delaware, Ontario. She's one of the founding members of Patients for Patient Safety Canada and the patient partner since 2006. It was a tragic and preventable loss of her son, Daniel, that changed the course of her life. That pain combined with her never-ending passion for safety and improvement resulted in many changes, both in the organization when Daniel inc Daniel's incident happened, as well as at Canadian level. She is currently the chair of the Patients for Patient Safety Canada Knowledge Transfer Working Group, and she's the moderator of all of our webinars. So many of you may already know Teresa. So please join me in welcoming Teresa as our moderator today. Thank you, Iona, and uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, this is a, a wonderful topic today. And just as we get started again in the chat room, uh, we're gonna ask you to enter your definition of patient safety, just to get you thinking along that lines. Um, and we will look at that later and we'll come back to um, that a discussion of that definition. But it's my great honor to introduce our first, um, first speaker. Um, uh, oop, that, yeah, let's go back to Iona, or Janet, go back to our agenda, and we'll go over that quickly. Um, what we're hoping today is that you'll leave, you'll leave with at least one very practical idea uh, that you could implement around patient safety. Uh, we are hoping your awareness of patient harm will increase, that you will get a better understanding of real life experience of the patients who are gonna present and the providers who will be presenting. Um, and there will be a list of resources about patient safety that you will see. Uh, so we have four speakers. They will present their story and after each of them, we'll have a question and answer period. Uh, we thank you for all the questions that you sent in um, and we'll try to address them in those times. So now it's my very great honor to introduce our first speaker. Donna Davis uh, is a past co-chair of Patients for Patient Safety Canada. Um, she has partnered on the development of uh, countless initiatives, including the Canadian Disclosure Guidelines, the Canadian Incident Analysis Framework, and the Patient Safety Education Program. She's done presentations for more than a decade, provincially, nationally, and internationally, about her personal experience, and most important, about her son, Vance, who tragically passed away related to an adverse event. Um, Dawn is a very active contributor in her region in Saskatchewan, where she helped develop the Patient and Family Advisory Council. She's a passionate advocate for patient and fam family-centered care, um, and including that in many programs, setting policy, making decisions. Um, she is a nurse and a manager at Gainsborough Health Centre in Saskatchewan, and I welcome you, Donna. 
Over to Donna. Thank you very much, Teresa. And good morning and good afternoon to all of you across Canada, because for some of you it will be afternoon. And I just want to thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to attend this webinar hosted by Patients, that is Patients for Patient Safety Canada. We are a group of some 70 patients and family members from across Canada whom themselves or their loved ones were harmed by care intended to help them. We are very fortunate and so proud to be a program of the Canadian Patient Safety Institute. We are the patient voice in the Canadian Patient Safety Institute, working closely with them in all their programs and initiatives. And you can learn more about Patients for Patient Safety Canada and the many resources for patients, families, and providers at www.patientsforpatientsafety.ca and more about the Canadian Patient Safety Institute and its many resources for patients, families, and providers at www.patientsafetyinstitute.ca. And I'm sure those addresses will be put in the chat box for you. Um, I've been a nurse longer than I've been a mom. Patient safety affects me in both roles. But today I'm going to talk to you today about my personal experience with patient safety as a mom and why spreading the knowledge from the Ipsos report is so important. I think like most Canadians, actually not just Canadians, but people across the world, I thought healthcare was safe. Our first child was born with a high level spina bifida, a congenital birth defect, which causes paralysis, hydrocephalus, bowel and bladder issues, which of course she had them all, among other problems. With many hospitalizations and many surgeries, we had seen the best of healthcare, and we also had some not so good encounters. But if anyone had asked me if healthcare was safe, I wouldn't have hesitated to say yes. Never once did I think Deidre could be harmed by the care intended to help her. After all, I worked in healthcare. Patients were safe. We helped them. We healed them. We didn't harm them, did we? All that changed on March 27, 2002 when our 19-year-old son, Vance, had a single vehicle rollover. He walked away from the accident when the RCMP didn't come to help him, even though he had called three times for their, assist their assistance. But that's another narrative for another time. He was now missing. Fear like nothing I had ever known coursed through me. We finally found him after a 36-hour ground and aerial search, lying unconscious in a vacant trailer with his blood-covered cell phone in his hand, four miles from the accident site. Vance was transferred to our nearest emergency center, and that's where the first communication error occurred. His outpatient report stated that he had been found wandering around, and of course that's crucial information for the hospital to have where he was sent, that he was actually found unconscious. There is strong belief that this erroneous information contributed to the stereotyping that surrounded Vance when he was transferred to the city for more care. Stereotyping that identified Vance as a 19-year-old who had been drinking and driving and deserved to be right where he was. That was the feeling staff gave us with their words and their actions. You may not remember what people will say, but you will always remember how they made you feel. The RCMP had determined though, when they finally came to the accident scene, that drinking had not been involved and his blood test done at the hospital um, also showed no alcohol, although it was so many hours afterwards, it probably wouldn't have been evident um, at that point anyway. But even though alcohol wasn't a factor, Vance's behavior and symptoms were attributed to that, not to the head injuries he obviously had. Staff bias and preconceived beliefs affected how he was cared for. We were told many times over the four days Vance was in the hospital that his injury was just a little worse than a mild concussion. Time and rest was all he needed. The doctor who admitted him was going away for the weekend, and that was fine. Everyone needs their time off. And we thought his care would be handed over to the neurosurgeon working that weekend. They had admitted him to the surgical intensive care unit to observe him. At least we thought a handover would take place but it did not. Vance was a patient without a doctor. As the days passed, 
I was worried about Vance's deteriorating condition. His vital signs were worsening. I told the staff of my concerns, but my concerns fell on deaf ears. I asked to speak to a doctor. I was told I couldn't. They didn't have time. Could we have a repeat CT scan, I asked. I was told they only do CT scans when necessary. Wasn't the deteriorating deteriorating condition of a 19-year-old worthy of a CT scan? We found out later that a high-resolution scan was recommended but wasn't done. Not until he crashed. It is at great peril that you ignore the concerns of a mother who knows their child best. Vance's pulse was 37. He was having periods of apnea. His level of consciousness was altered. I was told by the nurse working when I brought this concern forward that he was practicing what deep sea divers do. He was practicing not breathing. When I asked her in disbelief what she meant by that, I was told we see this all the time. Who was I to question the experts? And besides, I didn't want to alienate the people who would be caring for my son. The fear was compounded a thousand times from when he was first missing, as I saw him slipping away before my eyes. Why was I the only one who could see it? The sick feeling in my stomach, my mother's intuition, told me that things were going very wrong, but I couldn't get anyone to hear me. I remember even telling the housekeeper that came into his room on Sunday how worried I was about him. Would someone listen? I was told the seizure activity I witnessed was just tremors. It wasn't seizure activity. When he was transferred out of the ICU to the ward in this condition, and one of the nurses asked me, how long has he been flat like this? I was hopeful that finally someone was paying attention. Unfortunately, that was not the case. The nurse returned with a co-worker to do an assessment with her. The co-worker made certain myself and Vance's nurse knew that this was a waste of her time. Vance was fine. But of course he was not. Approximately five hours later, the neurosurgeon who was on call and had never been asked to see Vance over the weekend was called to see him. It was too late. Our hard-working, vibrant, brilliant, blue-eyed son was brain dead from serious head injuries. He had a right frontal contusion, a left frontal contusion, right and left temporal contusion, parietal contusion, basal skull fracture, right synodial fracture, a linear linear temporal occipital fracture, diffuse brain swelling, subarachnoid hemorrhage, and finally, uncle herniation. That does not sound like just a little bit worse than a concussion to me. To compound our pain and confusion, the staff avoided us after Vance crashed. We were left alone for hours as we waited for the people to come to do the paperwork for the donation of Vance's organs. We were told 10 people benefited from his death. We were confused and didn't know what to do. I knew what to do as a nurse when one of my patients passed. Now as a mom, I didn't know what to do. No one came to help us to see if we needed anything. In this busy place, the silence was deafening. I called our minister at home and cried to her, Kathy, Vance just died and I don't know what to do. Kathy called the hospital and asked someone to come and help us. We found out in the worst way possible that health care is not always safe. By the end of today, 378 patients will be harmed by the care intended to help them. By the end of the year, one in 18 hospital stays will result in at least one harmful event, and one in eight of those harmful events will end in the death of the patient. From the numbers I have just quoted you and from the hospital harm, from the hospital harm report, and those Chris will mention from the Ipsos report, you can see this is a systemic problem. It wasn't just one thing that contributed to Vance's death. It was many things. It happens across the world and across the continuum of care. Unfortunately, my fellow Patients for Patient Safety Canada members have experienced harm also. Martha, a young, promising nursing student, died when given a medication contraindicated in her condition. condition. Infant Matea died when her deteriorating condition wasn't recognized in time to save her life. 
fervid was given medication for a condition she did not have, which resulted in permanent loss of function. Misdiagnosis resulted in delay of treatment for Robin. An absence of follow-up on crucial tests resulted in Greg's death from a very preventable disease, and the list goes on. That is why it is so important to make the public and providers aware of patient safety and how it can impact them. The Ipsos report shows that public awareness of patient safety is lacking, but when informed of the facts and figures, it changes their perception. I would venture to say that many providers are in the dark also. Recently, when I made a presentation to nursing students about to graduate before I started, I asked what patient safety meant to them. Afterwards, in the evaluation, I asked if they had a new understanding of patient safety and now what it meant to them. 100% answered yes, they had a new understanding. Falls and doing the proper surgery was replaced with listening, proper diagnosis, assessment, teamwork, etc. Knowledge about patient safety, knowledge about what patients and families can do to help keep their care safe, knowledge for providers of processes they can follow and put in place will help to achieve the Patients for Patient Safety Canada vision of every patient safe. Communication between the patient and family and the providers is key. Recognizing the value of the patient family input, trust that they know themselves or their loved ones best, respect that places them as a member of the team, striving for the best possible outcome, just as providers are wanting the best possible outcome. We'll see the shift to inclusion of the patient and family in care decisions, which will result in patient safety improvement and see a decrease in the harm that occurs every day. We have come a long way. Just to be acknowledging that harm happens and to talk about it is a vast improvement from years past. In, the, in 2002, when Vance died, no one wanted to mention the word harm. It is a relief to be able to talk about it and not hide from the facts anymore. You cannot fix what you don't acknowledge. Let's acknowledge and talk about patient safety and the harm that happens. Don Berwick says, some is not a number, soon is not a time. Let's work in partnership to see every patient safe in the safest healthcare system in the world, and let's do it right now. If I may, I'd like to read Donna, a I'm just first. Gonna, Donna, I'm just going to interrupt because we're... we're um the time, the clock is pushing us a bit, and maybe we can come back to that if we have time at the end. Okay, um, I'd just like to say thank you to everyone that's okay. listening, the providers that are um, for your dedication to patient safety and for all you do for patients and families, and to the patients and families listening, be an active participant of your care, speak up, learn what you can do to keep yourself and your loved ones safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Donna, for that very passionate introduction. I do have one. I'm going to just ask you one question before we go to our next speaker. Um, could you give us your definition of patient safety from a patient perspective? From my, short... pers yeah, yes. from my perspective, yeah. it means no harm. It means the best possible outcome for the patient. Okay. Good. Thank you. And I think that sets us up nicely. Thank you, Donna, so much for sharing Vance's story. He has uh, affected so many people, um, as you have, so thank you. Um, our next speaker is uh, Christopher Thrall. He is a communications officer from CPSI, Canadian Patient Safety Institute. He uses his skills as a storyteller to support this very worthy cause of patient safety. Um, he wants to tell them uh, in the most effective ways what's possible. Um, he, has, um, he has a BA in history from the University of Alberta. Um, he's enrolled in the Grant McEwen's Public Relation Program. He served in com communication roles for the past 15 years, supporting organizations ranging from the Citadel Theater and the Alberta Melk to the River Valley Alliance and the University of Alberta. For many of these 15 years, he wrote freelance articles for several local newspapers. In his spare time, he reads, he writes, he does historical reenactments, enjoys his three wonderful daughters. 
Um, and today he's going to give us uh, a summary of the Ipsos report, um, which we are all very excited about. So I'm gonna hand this over to Christopher. Beautiful, thank you so much, Teresa. And thank you, Donna, for that amazing story. I was quite deeply affected by that myself. Um, I do want to apologize in advance uh, to everybody here. There is a lot of content on the slides that I'm going to be sharing today. Please just give them a glance and let my soothing voice wash over you. The slides and the full report will be available for download later so you can immerse yourself in the details. However, let's start it up. Um, in September 2017, Patients for Patient Safety Canada members uh, set an objective to increase the public and elected official awareness about patient safety and patients as partners. In early 2018, CPSI Communications contracted an Ipsos Public Affairs Survey for a baseline on Canadian understanding of patient safety as well as how they prioritize the issue. We also asked for their experience with patient safety incidents, which we defined as preventable harm to patients resulting in prolonged health care, disability, or death. We gave examples such as contracting infections or suffering falls and incorrect diagnoses. We discovered that one in three Canadians have either personally experienced a PSI or have a loved one who did. In the report, we compared results from those who had experienced PSIs with those who hadn't. First of all, we asked about how well, well people knew about these listed healthcare issues. As you can see, Canadians have the highest awareness about hospital wait times. As for patient safety, down the list, you, only 3 in 10 Canadians say they know it very well or a fair amount. 5% say they've never even heard of it. Caregivers and those with a chronic illness are, of course, significantly more likely to say they are knowledgeable about patient safety. We then ask Canadians to rank healthcare issues in terms of their top three priorities. Again, hospital wait times, along with long-term senior care, were top of mind. Only one-third of Canadians rank patient safety in their top three priorities, with fewer than one in ten ranking at first. The next section of the survey asked about patient safety knowledge and concern. The first question was, in terms of leading causes of death in Canada, where do you think PSIs rank? As we know, patient safety incidents are the third leading cause of death in Canada, but only one in 10 knew that. Half of Canadians ranked PSIs outside of the top five causes of death, with more than one in 10 ranking them outside the top 10. The answers weren't, unfortunately, significantly highly, higher among those who had experienced a PSI. How often do you think someone dies in Canada from a patient safety incident was the next question. Only one in 10 thought it was anywhere close to the reality of once every 13 minutes. Answers ranged from hourly to weekly with nearly 40% having no idea. As you can see, among those who experienced a PSI, the answers were significantly higher. Finally, we shared the financial cost of patient safety incidents, $2.75 billion per year. We asked if this were higher or lower than they expected. And as you can see, 60% said it was higher, with one in three saying it was much higher than they expected. So this slide, as dense as it is, could be the most important slide in the presentation. We revealed that patient safety incidents are the third leading cause of death in Canada, that PSI-related death occurs every 13 minutes, and that they cost the system $2.75 billion per year. We asked if that knowledge changed our respondents' healthcare priorities. After they received the facts, there was a very significant change in patient safety incident prioritization. Up from one third, three quarters of Canadians ranked patient safety in their top three priorities and one quarter named it the number one issue in healthcare. By the end of the survey, three quarters of Canadians were concerned about experiencing a patient safety incident for themselves or a loved one. This is higher among those who had already experienced a PSI, of course. We followed up with a question about who has responsibility for ensuring patient safety. Firmly ahead were healthcare providers and hospital leadership, but of real interest was that nearly half the respondents said 
that patients and their families should take responsibility for their care as well. This concept of shared responsibility among providers, government, and patients themselves is the model that we support here at CPSI and with PFPSC. So in conclusion, we know that overall awareness of patient safety and patient safety incidents is low. Even among the one-third who have experienced a PSI, few Canadians are aware of the significance of the issue or how much it costs us, both financially and in human lives. However, when they are presented with the facts, Canadians overwhelmingly place a higher priority on patient safety. Increasing awareness of patient safety is key, not just about how Canadians can stay safe, but on the toll PSIs take, both in terms of increased costs and of lives lost. Canadians are not aware how serious of an issue patient safety is, and education is needed to close the gap. Together, and armed with this information, we can make a difference. Patients for Patient Safety Canada members can lead by sharing their stories and reveal the personal impact of harm in our healthcare system. These stories serve as ways to connect with people, and then we can use this report to walk them through the system-wide crisis we face. Once people are equipped with the facts, they become deeply concerned and want ways to keep themselves safe in our healthcare system. CPSI tools and resources are available to help. Finally, these are the conclusions that we have drawn from this study. We have the information. It is up to us to share it. The report is available on the CPSI website, and it contains several details that I didn't have time to address in this presentation. I would be happy to take questions about the report, our conclusions, or the next steps that we're planning. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris, for reviewing that very, very important survey. The question I, ha I have for you, and I'm looking from the questions we received, given the crucial importance of this information, do you have a sense of how best to reach the public in a, a way that isn't alarming, but it really helps to, to activate their awareness? Do you have some ideas about that? Um, we are hoping to, well, we're developing some infographics, we're developing some shareable tools, etc. but really where it starts is by telling stories. One third of Canadians have been affected by patient harm. If we equip, if we encourage the sharing of these stories and then from sharing those stories and building the connections between people, we can move them over into suggestions as to how to improve things, both individually in terms of um, preventing individual patient harm through conversation, through, through outreach, but also systemically. We have to be able to equip people in both ways to be able to protect themselves and be able to demand, require, request changes to the systems so that patient safety is a priority in every decision that's made through our healthcare systems. Thank you for that. Uh, a follow-up question. You talked about uh, the way forward is a shared responsibility uh, for patient safety. Do you have, and I know you're a media person, do you have some thoughts about what, from the survey, what's the key information to get across that shared responsibility and the sort of the best way to present that? Do you have some thoughts about that? Um, the, the summary that I gave in terms of the three bullet points is really our transitional message. It's a matter of share that story of personal harm, move people through the three bullet points of, uh, of a, 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 losing a life every 13 minutes, uh, the cost to the healthcare system, and, um, and, and make, those, make those realities present in every listener, and then equip them to both A, find ways to keep themselves safer in the healthcare system, and B, uh, reach out to their uh, political, the government uh, representatives to demand the changes that are required. So it's sort of a three-step process to build that connection, equip them with information, and then encourage them to take action. And with, the, with those three steps moving through with every person in Canada, we're going to make the changes that we need here. Great. Thank you for that. Um, so now we've got that we have um, Donna's very passionate story. We have the, the sort of the picture that Chris has described about patient safety. So our next speaker is uh, going to extend the conversation. John Maxted 
is um, practices and teaches uh, comprehensive family medicine at the Markham Family Medicine Teaching Unit, where he helped to establish um, at the Markham Stofill Hospital. He is the academic chief of the teaching unit accountable to the hospital and the University of Toronto. He's a recognized expert in patient safety and in significant event analysis. He's been a family physician leader and an advocate for patient safety locally and nationally. He's led the drive to raise the importance of patient safety for the Department of Family and Community Medicine at the University of Toronto. He's a member of the advisory faculty to the Canadian Patient Safety Institute, and he was featured in its Hands in Healthcare magazine in 2016. He, ha he is an associate professor in the Faculty of Medicine, um, primarily, and his focus has been the advocacy for patient safety in primary care. He's a director on the boards of the College of Family and Physicians of Canada and the Health Standards Organization, uh, which is part of Accreditation Canada. So we're delighted that you're with us today, John. So I'll just hand it over to you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, can hear you. Thank you very much. Well, thanks everybody for this opportunity and a good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I think the comments that I have to offer this afternoon really build on both Donna's story as well as the survey that Chris has just released to us, which has some very interesting information for us to, to debate and to discuss. Um, my contribution to this discussion is going to be brief, but it's going to be in five statements on five slides uh, that summarize, I hope, what I've taken from this survey. To complement this, I'm going to offer some comments and questions that may be provocative to generate your conversation. And as a caveat, I want to acknowledge that most of my clinical work and teaching is in primary care, but nevertheless, my, my feeling as well is that my comments will likely be broad enough to ring true for most healthcare settings that you can relate to. My first statement then is don't be surprised by how much the public knows about patient safety. Providers don't know that much more. This study suggests that the public is generally unaware about the frequency and the relative rankings of patient safety in healthcare. Providers are often unaware as well, I would suggest. This gap in providers' knowledge is often because of the various competing priorities that providers deal with, including patient safety, for our attention to the quality of care in our healthcare system. I ask, is this, is this competition acceptable? How could we prioritize patient safety and QI? How, we, I would say as well that we struggle to, to make patient safety a priority in education and clinical practice. This should start early in the careers of healthcare providers so it is held up as a standard of practice. I recently had a wonderful experience teaching MedRec in the second year undergrad curricula to a combined class of medicine and pharmacy students. It opened my eyes to the importance of early education in patient safety. My next statement is changing our approach to patient safety requires greater awareness and greater engagement between patients and providers. Patients must ask the question of the providers. How safe is my care? How safe is that medication? That plan of care for my cancer? My hurt, my procedure. How does my age affect the safety of my care? Having the courage to ask the question improves engagement and awareness between patients and providers. Having the courage improves the patient safety culture to reap the benefits of safer care. Patient safety should be an explicit part of the clinical, clinical guidelines and evidence bases that direct and influence our shared care decisions. It should be an integral part of our healthcare system. Patients should not have to wait to see if it, will, if it will emerge in their care plans. Third statement, recognizing what aspects of care have the greatest risks for patient safety will improve engagement and awareness. Does the responsibility for this recognition belong to the healthcare system or does it reside with the individual patients and providers and in their interactions? 
We could debate that perhaps later on. Discussing safety should not threaten or shame providers. It's an opportunity for shared decision making to deliver the safest care possible. This next slide is a summary of several systematic reviews one that I conducted several years ago with CPSI, which has since been supported as well by uh, different syst systematic reviews that have been re released more recently by the BMJ Quality and Patient Safety Journal, in which we highlight the greatest patient safety risks in healthcare, which are medication management as being the one that's most frequent, making a diagnosis as being the one that's probably most serious, and transferring patient information in a multitude of ways as being one that is increasingly exponential as a result of uh, the complexity and the electronic technology that we are now pursuing in our healthcare system. Today's survey identified misdiagnosis, falls, infections, and mistakes in treatment as the most common safety incidents experienced by patients. However, even if we cannot remember survey details such as the frequency or the relative rankings of patient safety incidents, patients and providers should remember that patient safety risks reside within these three domains in our healthcare system. Fourth statement, communication, which is already mentioned by both of our previous presenters, between patients and providers is essential in patient safety. I would point out that patients and providers may differ in their understanding of what patient safety means. To clinicians, it may mean fully informing patients about their risks and obtaining their consent. To patients, it may mean deciding whether the overwhelming desire for care is worth the risks. Competing priorities sometimes make this a difficult conversation. Keeping our communication transparent is also important, but it's not about catching the provider off guard. How do we use communication to bridge the gap and to manage the tension that patient safety can create between patients and providers? An even greater challenge is, if we haven't, have experienced a safety incident, how do we use communication to turn blame and fault finding into an opportunity for safer care? My last statement and my last slide is this one and perhaps one of the most important, patient-provider partnerships make healthcare safer. Patients should engage providers in conversations to achieve a common understanding about patient safety. This is what I would say is patient empowerment. Who's most responsible? In the survey, patients believe providers are most responsible at 77%, while themselves at 46%. Is this the way it should be, I would ask? Patient-centered care is about patient-provider partnerships where patient safety is a shared responsibility. When we achieve this, we'll have made greater strides to improve the culture of patient safety in our healthcare system, I think. Thanks again for this opportunity. I look forward to further discussion and listening to your comments and questions. Thank you, John. That was very helpful. Uh, the first question, could you talk a little bit more about um, your last point about patient-centered care being a shared responsibility? Are there things you've discovered over the years in your practice how to just encourage and engage patients to take on that role? I, I think uh, that probably comes back to my comment around having the courage. Um, I think I don't think providers uh, willingly or uh, knowledgeably try to hide things from patients or try to uh, be ignorant about the kind of information that may be of benefit or, or, or helpful to patients. But I think sometimes we need to have patients trigger or tweak our thinking a little bit to make us pay more attention to patient safety and to have that conversation and be willing to have that conversation with our patients. Okay. Um, then have, have you noticed as patients come to you, what are some of the strategies they're using that really work to affect, you know, get that partnership going? Have you noticed some approaches that really work well? 
Well, being in family medicine and primary care, of course, one of our greatest greatest uh, benefits is the relationship that we have with our patients. And I think that it's important to have a relationship with your provider in such a way that you can ask those kinds of questions, that you can have the courage. And I also think it's important to have time and take time to do that. Sometimes we need to be explicit about that. And that's why I have suggested in my presentation that really we need to make sure that this is an integral part, patient safety is an integral part of our, our healthcare system, because otherwise it tends to be forgotten in the many, many, many other competing priorities that come about as we try to go through a care plan for our patients. Okay. Uh, and so my next question follows from there. What would you say to a new doctor starting out? in terms of awareness of patient safety? Is there a sort of an inspiring statement or basic um, things that they can help to keep patient safety front of mind? Well, it's a good question. I mean, one of the things that we are increasingly learning is how important it is to include patient safety um, in their teaching. Uh, just as I relate to my, my conversation, my teaching with the med students and pharmacy students, uh, I think that I mean, that was their first, obviously, introduction to MedRec. And um, as MedRec, as an example, becomes more important, for example, we, be, we, we, we start to include it more and more in our everyday practice and the way we manage patients and the way we discuss uh, issues and, and care plans with patients. And I think that what we need to do is to give these kinds of things more predominance and make them more explicit in our conversations such that we can include them. I think the new doctors are becoming more aware and I think they're probably becoming smarter as far as patient safety is concerned than the older doctors such as myself have been in the past and that's because it's now coming to the forefront we're now making a bigger thing of it it's becoming more obvious that it's a very very important part of clinical practice it's a very very important part of our healthcare system just as Chris has highlighted in the uh, in the in, in the uh, survey that he released to us okay good thank you for that um... And I think at that point, we'll move on to our last speaker. Um, again, this is another patient perspective. So Angie Hansen is going to join us. She has a background in gerontology, gerontology, but she has been much more focused on pediatrics in the last decade. She is a parent of a child with a complex medical history. Her son, Charlie, has been in and out of hospital since his birth. In 2011, Angie wanted to help other families, so she began volunteering as a patient advisor. She now volunteers with multiple healthcare organizations, including hospitals, Patients for Patient Safety Canada, Healthcare Can, and the Health Standards Organization. She is the vice chair of a family advisory council, and she's involved in many projects. She presents to staff, residents, and medical students about patient experience and patient and family-centered care. She speaks at conferences about patient portals and patient engagement. She advocates for patient safety with through our organization, Patients for Patient Safety Canada. Um, when Charlie's medical issues stabilized, she wanted to understand the impact of his experience, so she started taking neuroscience and cognitive science courses at Carleton University. And she has just completed her BA in psychology and focused on children's experiences in hospitalization related to chronic health concerns. She now works as an advocate for clients who have ALS um, and helps them navigate through the system. So very uh, fortunate we have Angie with us today. Angie, I'll hand it over to you. Do we have Angie? Oh, am I muted still? No, nope, we can hear you loud and clear. Excellent. Perfect. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really, really thrilled to be here. This is a wonderful opportunity to see so many people passionate about patient safety. Um, do I have control of the slides? Oh, there we go. There we go. There's my son. There's Charlie. When Charlie was a baby, um, I just want to start out by saying that I know a lot of our conversation has been focused about the fact that this event have led to or lead to uh, patient deaths every 13 minutes. And what I wanted to bring forward was that it's not only about death, 
right? It's not only about the patients who die, it's about all of the other patients who, who then live with complications that they didn't need to have or, or need extra procedures and, and, and more health care and they're, they're struggling to um, continue to live with the consequences of those harms. So it's not just about the statistics, not just about, about death, but about harm and, and all of that, all that that encompasses. The impact on families, the impact on on children as they grow up, it's 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 so much bigger than just than any one thing. Um, so let's, let me back it up. This is my son Charlie. When he was um, an infant, uh, he had a surgery at three months old, and developed a post-op infection, which is totally normal. It was treated. But what no one realized was that it traveled to his brain. So when he was um, two weeks post-op, I brought him back to the hospital and said, you know, his soft spot's bulging out. Um, and they, they checked for fever, they checked for all these signs and symptoms and didn't find anything wrong. So said, as long as, it was, as, long as he was asymptomatic, it was going to be, it was nothing, nothing to worry about. I went back to my doctor several times, and every time she said, well, what did the hospital say? And I said, well, as long as he's asymptomatic, it's nothing. So she said, there's your answer, um, and, and, and it was nothing. Months passed, seven months from the, the date of the surgery, I brought him back to the doctor again, and she said, I, I don't know what else to tell you. You might as well bring him to the hospital. So I brought him to the emergency room again and said again, his soft spot keeps bulging out. Uh, he did have a slight low-grade fever today, but that's, it's gone by the time I got to the hospital. And the nurses in the emergency room at triage said, well, then why are you here? So I said, well, should I go? Should I go home then? I mean, this is, this is something that's been going on for months. And they said, well, no, you're here now. We've got to check it out. He was, he was given a CT scan to reassure me before sending me home. And the CT scan revealed a mass in his brain. So um, we didn't go home for 13 weeks. We stayed in the hospital. Charlie had brain surgery at 11 months old and 13 weeks of medications. We didn't realize at the time how close he came If he had been born 10 years earlier, they wouldn't have had the diagnostic imaging capabilities sensitive enough to pick it up. If he'd been born in a different part of the world where we didn't have easy access to these types of scans and we would have had to travel, we, we, we probably wouldn't have been able to do that. The mass in Charlie's brain was five centimeters by four and a half centimeters big. It was his entire left frontal lobe at 11 months old <clears throat> abscess from this infection that had been growing for seven months. He was fit, he was healthy, and I kept asking, how did the infection get into his brain? And no one could tell me. They said, you know, we don't know. It seems like there was probably a tract into the brain that the infection came in but with the pressure, it sealed itself shut. We can't even see it on the MRI, but if it was still open, it would be leaking cerebral spinal fluid. So we know that there's no tract anymore. We got home, and a few months later, he was healthy, he was happy, he was healing, and we decided um, we, we had his next follow-up with, with his surgeon to talk about his um, palate repair, because Charlie has a cleft lip and palate. And I happened to mention, while we were at the appointment with the plastic surgeon, I happened to say, oh, you know, he's got this little um, dimple on the tip of his nose. And I know it's not a big deal, but when you do his nose job as a teen, are you going to cut around it? Like, how does that work? And 
the surgeon took a look and he said, well, it's so tiny, it's the smallest one I've ever seen, but I think it's a little cyst, so we'll have to have that checked out. So he goes back into the hospital a couple months later to have this cyst taken off the tip of his nose, where they discover that it, it continues under the nasal bone and all the way into his brain. So this was the tract that they hadn't been able to see on the scans. But we'd known about this dimple on the tip of his nose since he was born. You see it in every baby picture. So even when they were looking for scans, for, for, through scans, and even when they were looking for how this infection got into the brain, it was right there literally on the tip of his nose. So then he had to come back in a couple of days later, six days later, for, for a craniotomy, where they took off the front of his skull so that they could remove this tract and cut, uh, seal it, so that it would, nothing could get back into the brain again. Otherwise, he would have continued to have infections in his brain, and he would have died again. It's not easy knowing that if I hadn't asked that question, no one would have found it because no one was looking. I don't fault the first emergency room doctor who sent us away. You know what? He didn't. He didn't have any symptoms. I don't fault them at all. I went back and I got the records and they checked. They checked for fever. They checked for irritability. They checked everything. Sometimes you just don't present. And I don't mind that. What bothered me was the communication. And that I was told that if it was asymptomatic, it was nothing, not when to come back. What, what were the symptoms to watch for if it didn't go away? And when I went to my GP and was told again repeatedly, well, if you want, you can go back to the emergency room and sit there for hours, but you know it's nothing. So it was that, that um, misplaced trust, perhaps. And that was very difficult to handle. Um, Charlie, oh, hang on a second. How do I move to the next? There we go. There we go. Thank you, Janet. Charlie's been a complicated kid. This is, I think, six or seven volumes of his chart. He has nine or ten by now. He's had more issues. Um, one of the other things that Charlie was born with, with the cleft lip and palate, was also a heart condition. And he had to have open heart surgery. The first surgery that he had to put a patch in, um, we got out afterwards, had our six-week follow-up, and the patch had torn. So we had to go back in for another open heart surgery a few months later. It wasn't urgent. It was fine. So we went in a few months later. He had his second open heart surgery, and he was healing even faster than the first time. It was absolutely incredible. We thought, five days in the hospital, we'll be home in three. Like, this kid is just healing like a superhero. What's the one that uh, heals himself? Um, anyway. The doctor came in and said, well, you know what? There's a little bit of fluid gathering around the heart, and I'm a chicken. It's probably fine, but I'm, just, I'm, I'm a chicken. I'm going to keep you in until tomorrow and do another scan. We stayed in the hospital for an additional day. They did another echocardiogram the next day. They said, oh, it's still not gone. We could send you home for the weekend, but look, we're going to keep you in for the weekend because I'm just, I'm scared. I, I, I just, I'm, I'm a chicken. Monday morning comes around, and I pack his bag, and I get ready to go. And the nurse, oh, sorry, the cardiac surgeon comes into the room and says, he looks awesome, he looks fabulous. You guys are going home today? I, like, he's, he's, he's amazing. Just one quick scan, and then you'll be on your way. We go down for the scan, come back upstairs, and the nurse met us at the elevator and said, what has he had to eat today? So I thought, oh, crap. We're going to have to do another, we're going to have to go in for another, for a general anesthetic, and they're going to have to do one of the transesophageal echoes, where they put the camera down the throat to look at the heart, because they didn't get quality images. So I thought to myself, okay, I'm going to wait. So 
I went to the playroom with my son to let him play. And sure enough, the surgeon came into the playroom, and I thought, I knew it. He needs another scan. And the surgeon sat down and said, there's more fluid around his heart, and it's starting to collapse. He needs emergency surgery immediately. Grabbed him, went back to the room, put him on the bed, wheeled him down, and brought him right into surgery so that they could insert a drain so that his heart would not, would not collapse. Had we been sent home when he looked so healthy, he would have died that day in a matter of hours, minutes, possibly. So it's so amazing that we have this level of care, and when someone catches something, it, it, this is when it goes right, right? This is an example of, of, of what happens and what a difference you can make when everything goes well. This is Charlie one day after that happened in the intensive care unit, lying in bed one week after open heart surgery, one day after emergency heart surgery, laughing as he's watching cartoons. This is what we want. We, this is what we need. We need to be able to learn from these near misses and to, to take those lessons. And it, it's not just about, it's not about retribution. It's not about making someone pay. It's about learning and how to build this capacity going forward to catch things before they become a problem. And I know that we are almost out of time. And yes. I'm so um, I just, I just really wanted to focus on those systemic changes that we can make in engaging patients and families. I speak at orientation to staff, med students, nursing students. We have, at every orientation, we have family members coming to present at our hospital. And I think it is so important to engage people from the get-go in the schools and in your organizations. So thank you so much for coming and for caring. And I'll stop talking now. But thank you so much. Thank you, Angie. I think you perfectly summarized our webinar today. And thank you, everyone, for coming to listen. This is such a crucial topic. Um, Iona, I think you have one quick summary before we sign off. And you had something else you were going to raise. Over to Iona. Yeah, just a big thank you to all I of see, the speakers. I'm just finishing up a webinar here. Can you just give me two minutes? OK, yeah, go ahead. I'll give you a call right back, OK? OK, thanks. Bye-bye. All right. Oh, sorry, I so, think that was a sidebar. Uh, <laughs> Go sidebar ahead. discussion. That's okay. Yeah. Uh, people are getting ready to their next meetings, and that's, yes. uh, that's the truth of our uh, world. Just a big thank you to all of our speakers, Donna, John, Christopher, Angie. Uh, it's fantastic to all of our participants for contributing in the chat with so much wisdom and links to other resources. We will send you a note with the slides as well as um, a recording so you can share it with others. And of, of course, the link to the IPSO survey and any other resources you may be using to keep yourself and others safe. Uh, with this, thank you for taking a minute to complete our evaluation poll. It has a question about today's webinar, but also uh, what should we do next in future webinars? Again, those are developed by patients for patients and the public. And this is a strategy that Patients for Patient Safety Canada is actively working on, increasing the public, including the government's awareness of patient safety and what they can do to keep ourselves safe, as well as uh, Patients for Patient Safety Canada is building an alliance with other patient groups from across Canada because we know we need to work on this together. So thank you all so very much. And thank you, Teresa, especially for chairing and moderating this meeting. I wish you all a wonderful day.